I'm not sure. I, I think I, I'm known to most of you guys, uh, but my name is Sean Cullen. I work for the Geological Survey of Ireland, which is a part of the Department of en Environment, Climate and Communications. Uh, it used to be DK, so DEC is a lot better than DK. And um, what I'm going to talk about tonight really is the Infomar project in general, but also just mapping the seabed of, around Ireland, why we do it, how we do it, and and hopefully, you know, throw up a, a couple of questions for the end. Now that's about the prettiest picture I'm going to show you all night. Uh, it was taken by Daryl up in Inish Boffin when we were serving serving around the islands up there. And that's the RV Carey on your port side and the Maybird. And it has the Geo sitting outside the Carey. And just for the record, this is an OGA event. So if you look at the Carey's aluminium configuration of masts and antennas up there, she does have a, a gaff boom and therefore qualifies quite nicely for this talk. Yeah. So this is just about Infomar and the work of the Marine Coastal Unit of the GSI. Now we are also partners with the Marine Institute and I'll, I'll go into some of the, the, the contribution that they make to the program as well. It all started uh, back in the late 90s uh, with, the, with a guy called Ray Carey after whom the RV Carey is named. And he really pushed for funding from the state to map the entirety of our, of our seabed to modern standards, right? And what they did is they kicked off the Irish National Seabed Survey um, to follow on from what was a UNCLOS, i.e. the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea claim to the natural resources that would lie on the seabed, not in the water column. That's a different thing with the EEZ, but what's actually on the seabed. And the GSI itself, the Geological Survey, um, was very you know, involved in the international effort to, to allow countries to, to look at exploring further than your EEZ and claiming that as potential resources for the countries uh, contiguous to those areas. And they came up with a thing called the Gardner Formula which was after Pierce Gardner, who worked for the GSI. And he established the fact that if you could go off the continental shelf and the thickness of the sediment at the bottom of the continental shelf would determine a line in the sand, so to speak, between international claims and national claims. And so that's what the, the PAD, the Petroleum Affairs Division, sponsored a survey on the periphery of that area and uh, Ray Carey then brought in the idea, well, we've done that far out. Why can't we do the rest of it? And that's how the Irish National Seabed Survey was kicked off. And that was done mostly by contract vessels. And in the late days of the INSS, uh, we got the Celtic Explorer involved as well. And I was out on her quite a lot in, in my early uh, stint here with the GSI. So yeah, so the, the Irish National Seabed Survey then morphed into the Infomar project, which is a 20 year project funded by the, by the government. So why government mapping? I'm gonna click through these quickly so you can read them rather than me talk to each one. Uh, but it, it is a national effort. Uh, there's no discernible gains that you can get from it commercially, but it does have a knock-on effect um, to augment industry and commercialism into the, the blue economy. And that's why the government saw the light and commissioned the Informal Project so that we can actually um, you know, utilize the knowledge to make economic gains in the future. And that was the planning behind it. And it's, quite, it's kind of unique in the world because a lot of other countries um, survey their own waters and then the military are the only people that see it. 
or very few commercial aspects get to get hold of it. And so there's, there's a lot of um, uh, groundbreaking ways of thinking about why we did this survey. I bet you there's another click or two, there you go. And prior to, the, to all of this, everything was old lead line data, um, disparate, you know, hodgepodges and collecting data from different sources. So the idea there was to get everybody involved and utilize our, our assets. And these are the assets. Um, you have to do this with ships, planes, and a few other things, but mostly with ships. And I think, you know, you got the Celtic Explorer up on the left there, with the Voyager below it, the Polar Stern, which was the German um, ship. And they did a lot of um, ground truthing of the, the outer extents of the banks and rock hall and that. And she's, she's an interesting one now because they just replaced her for a cost of some, somewhere in the region of 3 billion euro. Um, so that's the kind of money that's involved in these things. And then up on the top right there is the old, um, the Bly, which used to be the HMS Heckler. And there was a businessman down in Cork that bought her and configured her for multi-beam survey when it was still quite a, a novel idea. And she was part of the old Royal Navy, White Navy. She was also the hospital ship in the, in the Falklands. And Mick Gagan, who I think a few people might know, uh, he was one of the early project, you know, my, one of my predecessors anyway. And she was taken off to India and cut up for razor blades. But before she left, I was allowed on board and I went down in the hold and I took out the lathe and I took out the binnacle and I took out the, the um, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 the whale boat that was on the side of her, like it was a naval cutter and that's sitting in the west of Ireland now. And there's a few other bits and pieces of her that are lying around in my garden at the moment. So that was an interesting one. And then in 2006, there was a, a bit of a slush of money around just before the crash. And to be honest, it was actually broadband money was available through the department. And we were, we commissioned the building of the RV Carey and she was actually built down in Cape Town, my hometown. So I was down there for the, a bit of the build of that. And she's actually now proven to be one of the, the most capable, able, um, and economical vessels that we could, we could run as a government program. And a couple of other ones there, you can see down the bottom right is uh, the CONCAT, which is a fold upable container, I mean, uh, Catamaran that fitted into a container, leaky as a sieve, and an old um, inland fisheries boat down the bottom left, uh, which we, we I'll, I'll come on to that in a, in a bit. But th these are the kind of vessels which is for, for us mariners is kind of interesting stuff. And just a couple of pictures then, yeah, during the, the survey of the INSS and that, there's all the good stuff of, of being at sea and, and being happy in your job. So Infomar followed on from INSS and it's due to run from 2006 until 2026. Um, and it was broken up into different areas. But Infomar has this weird acronym that stands for the Integrated Mapping for Sustainable Development of Islands Marine. A lot of people think it just means, means information marine, but it's actually, it has a, a bit of a history behind it. You can't really read that very easily, but it is broken up into three sort of program areas. It's the data acquisition, the management of the data, and the interpretation of the data. And that'll become clearer as I go through this. Originally, we, we broke the survey effort up into priority bays, which in, in my view now with hindsight was actually a mistake because working in bays and going around the country and doing all the bays is actually doing the easy bits. And when the weather was really good, we weren't going out to the, the headlands and mapping the headlands while we could, because in the second phase, 
that's proven to be an issue in some ways. I mean, it's a 10 year issue, but it, it, it is harder to do. It's much better. And I've actually got recognition out of this now is that start in one area and do everything and work in a consistent manner around. But obviously every harbor master, every research project, everybody wanted to you know, have a bit of the action. So that's why it happened that way. But from an operational point of view, um, it made it kind of difficult. So that's just to update you on the, the inshore fleet. I don't know, can you guys actually see my cursor there? I don't know, nod if you can. So we have the, the Kerry here and uh, 11 meter Red Bay rib, an eight meter Red red Bay rib, and then a safe haven um, catamaran that we got off of um, safe haven down in Yaw, uh, it was about two years ago. And that's kind of the inshore fleet and we've added one more 11 meter Red Bay rib. So if you see them around, that's us. And since this picture was taken, they've all got branded with GSI and Infomar and all that. So easily recognizable. And just to let everybody know right from the start, if you ever encounter the vessels anywhere around the country and you know, in ports and harbors, please, please, you know, go on board, talk to the guys. They're more than happy to you know, lead you through what they're doing and, and probably do a lot better job than I'm going to do tonight. So. So that's it just graphically, just to show you like from the coast, um, the RV Geo works in the shallow water, and this is a lot to do with the MSO licensing. And then we have the, the 11 meter rib, the Lure, and the Galti has now joined her as well. And they can actually work from inshore and the offshore. But the Kerry originally was only allowed 20 miles off the coast. Now she's allowed 30 miles to join the Mallet at 30 miles off the coast. And what we've done with the Marine Institute, as I said, they had worked inside of 30 miles, but those are big vessels pushing a broom. And it's better they push the broom in the deep water where they can stay out for 24 or weeks at a time. Our, our inshore boats generally have to operate in uh, daylight hours. Uh, the pots are a huge problem. And yeah, and it's also, it's a manning issue as well. So, yeah, from a, a mariner's point of view, you can't just, you know, push people so hard that they work 18 hours a day in, in the middle of summer. It just doesn't work, you know, so. So just, yeah, as, as Johnny said at the start there, you know, the acreage is huge. And we've actually really gone beyond, you know, most people's expectations on the planet. And that's what Peter Heffernan, who used to be the CEO of the Marine Institute, um, coined the real map of Ireland. And it was, a, it was a great PR move. And we all loved the idea of the real map of Ireland because we can claim an, an ownership or a, an involvement with that. And that's what UNCLOS wants. They want you to be involved with the offshore um, side of the, you know, of the, of the economy really yeah so the real map of Ireland will will come up a, a little little bit later there and yeah you know, where Daryl saw us there in Inish Boffin we can also do the real map of Boffin and we can also do the real map of other places and once once you kind of square it off it's a really cool product that people understand what's out there underneath the water yeah so I'm gonna click it and then just on a, on a world scale, you can see there, you know, that's the globe in um, Google Earth. And that's, that's a layer that's actually in Google Earth. And you can see it, it's like, it's impressive. It's, um, you know, it's the size of a, a large European country when you look at it that way. Yeah. And then in the nitty gritty side of it, you know, Dublin Bay, old gaffers, that's what your bay looks like. Uh, this isn't the, the best picture of it, but it, it actually shows the um, the linear features of, of the features of the boats actually rocking and rolling. This is a very early picture of Dublin Bay, and it was mostly done by the Kelty Voyager, and we'll come back to that again later. 
that's a very bad chart of, of Dublin Bay. But if you look at the source diagram on the Dublin Bay chart, some of it has you know, partial sea coverage, partial this, but 90% of that chart was 1840 to 1880. And that was all done by lead line. Yeah. So this is where we changed the, the source diagram to a certain extent. However, we did leave a little strip up on the, the southern side of the Hoth um, Peninsula, which had um, Mr. Uh, Captain Bly's data in it. And I'm very, very reticent to go over that and erase them off the old Admiralty source chart, but one day we might. Yeah. But this, this, is, this is the game changer in terms of resolution. And this is very early data. So that's Dunleary Harbor. Um, you can see where the dredge has been in the middle and the pock marks from the, the, the moorings around the, the harbor. Uh, we've, we've done this several times already, but as I said, this is an early one. Um, and the resolution gets better and better every iteration of the actual hardware that we use. And I'll come on to that again later. And that's Dublin Port, you know, very early again, where we went in just to double check the charts. And this is where it gets really interesting because you, you you're kind of stepping on the toes of the Harbour Master's remit to supply data to the UKHO or the Mariner through the charting systems. And we found a few bumps here and there in the middle of the, the harbour, but it's kind of soft mud, but it was shallower than what was on the chart. And then we had to have an emergency meeting with the Harbour Master and say, what's going on here? And obviously it's kind of dynamic because any mapping system is just a snapshot. So it was agreed then with the UKHO that we would um, put it down as maintained at 7.5 meters and then became 8.5, I can't remember the numbers, but it was really important to realize that there were you know, different interests in having accurate data. So, Nowadays, the um, requirements for the dredging in Dublin Port are much more stringent than they were when we first ran up and down that river, yeah. Or that harbour, the port. So this is, okay, I'm gonna flick through some of this more generic stuff, but we all know the, the mantra that we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the, the ocean, and it's all because it's covered in water. How do we use to do it? Um, lead lines. I like the guy in the middle there. I, I never realized they swung the lead that high. It's a bit of a misnomer, you know, when they say swinging the lead is kind of being lazy, but it doesn't look like that guy was um, being lazy at all. Jacques Cousteau, uh, the early days of everything. And Bob Ballard, who was involved with quite a lot of the the exploration, I guess, of, of the deeper ocean um, and really unbeknownst to most people, he, he was one of the, I don't know, the, the guys that really pushed the, the um, technology that we could look at the deep ocean and that he was doing it under military guise of looking for something else, happened to see bits and pieces that would lead into the Titanic. They were actually looking for a submarine that the Russians had um, had sunk or yeah, I mean, it's a long story, but um, he's he's one of the one of the people that if you're really interested in this area, he's a really great talker and he has a lot of online stuff. So I think there's a, a live feed into the in, into his vessel, the Nautilus, which has an Irish um, manager in uh, John Toner, which I'm pretty sure a lot of people would know him. But John runs the Nautilus for Bob and they have a, a, a great online platform to get into the nitty gritty of ocean exploration. Yeah. And then you have the, the international way of looking at the seabed. And a lot of us just actually derive from satellites and gravity measurements and inferment of what, it, what it's all like down there. And it, it's pretty good for huge mountain ranges and big canyons. 
but the, the resolution, you know, needs something else. And that's why we started looking at um, using sonar and, and direct measurements, you know, that you can actually quantify and calibrate. Oops, sorry, there's... So th this is multi-beam and that's a picture of the Celtic Explorer and just shows like a, a fan of beams. So if you imagine every little white line, I don't know if you can see it that clearly, but every little white beam that's going down there is like a single beam echo sounder, very narrow beam on it. And they are spread out in a swath, which allows you then to, um, you know, discreetly pick out points and make a 3D image of the seabed as you move along. So I'm gonna go through some of the equipment and I might just fly through this because I'm already a half an hour into this and I know I could go on for about three hours, but uh, those are the two vessels. We know them fairly well around the country. Um, a lot of the gear that you don't see is normally underneath obviously. And some of them are, um, you know, well, uh, what do you call it, retractable units. <clears throat> And they're all very expensive multi-beam systems. You know, each one of those costs in the order of, I don't know, between a half a million and a quarter of a million for the hour systems up to closer to a million for the deep water systems. And they're very high tech. They need very close um, coordination. You know, so you have to map them onto the vessel firstly to millimeter accuracy. And then the motion that you measure at the same time as you're surveying can be extracted out of the data. So that's that's something that I'd, I'd, I'll touch on again in a couple of minutes. And then the GSI vessels, we start off with the Kiri and the Geo, and they just, um, like it's, you're talking about ribs and that, but they're actually pushing the same equipment around as the big ships. Sorry, that's an old one. So that's underneath the Kerry. We designed this pod system, <coughs> which has a, oh, excuse me, a sip of water. That red pod that's there, it actually has the multi beam, it has a USBL system in it, it has a sub bottom profiler in it, and it all fits in a very tight space. And working out the acoustics of that was a, a bit of a nightmare, a lot of maths. Um, but we, we eventually got it right. And it, you kind of design it so you put all the equipment in in the right place um, to make it easy to retract because that vessel does 20 knots when you're in transit. But that platform that holds it all, you can't go more than about nine knots before things start to shake and bend and all that sort of thing. So doing the engineering of it was really cool and interesting. And I loved all that side of it. Um, and then you've got to hope that the software can calibrate the, the, the bounces out of it at the end. And that's just an internal view of the Geo, which is a nice small little boat, but she's one of the, the best workhorses we can do um, work with. And, and you'll see in the data later on, she can get in anywhere. So I'll get past that. That's a multi-beam system hanging out of a boat. That's a side scan system. I'm not gonna get into it. I mean, you guys can ask me questions at the end, we can come back. This is what we call a, a vibracora. So that long tube, we can actually push it into the seabed and you can get very good geological and geophysical data out of that. And that has to be used off of the Marine Institute vessels uh, just by the size of it and also needing to stay stationary. That's just another picture of the geo. This is like just a, a backstory of, with inland fisheries it was in our department. They had this fisheries patrol vessel that was doing nothing. So what we did, we took it off them based on what we'd done on the geo. We went down to Arklo Marine and there's John Tyrrell and Peter Tyrrell. And we built a very similar thing, but different scale mounted a multi-beam on it and went off to sea and did multi-beam echo sounding. It was a bit of a hodgepodge, but that's what happens when you get a, a free vessel because 
government doesn't want to spend lots of money on this stuff, but they will um, free up assets and share them around, which is which is a kind of a thing with with government surveys, which is very different from my own private you know company surveys before, is that um, coordination and that can be difficult, but when it works, it works really well, and that's pretty cool. And the MI, the Marine Institute, are very good at that stuff. So this is just to make you aware of what happens, the difference between um, single beam echo sounding and multi beam echo sounding is that if you can see the three red ships there, they travel along, but a single beam only has a very discrete line of data. And those undetected dangers or shoals in between are undetected. So um, there are issues there from a navigation safety point. And sorry, I'm just going to flick through this because I know I won't have time, but these are all the different configurations of multi-beam for different depths and different resolutions, etc. And you have to tie them in. This is a point cloud of the Kiri taken with a laser scanner. And as long as you know the relationship between all of those little dots and your um, multi-beam beams, and you take the mathematical um, motion out of it, which we measure very accurately, that's how you get a, a very good seabed image. Yeah. And again, you've seen this, but that's us, you know, you can see those little funny white targets. That's using photogrammetry. So we can actually get nanometer, which is a thousandth of a centimeter accuracy in determining the angles between all the equipment that we are carrying around with us. Okay, so you're talking about really accurate um, geometry, which allows you then at the final product to have a geometry that can be less than half a meter off, if you like. Right? Again, I'm gonna fly through this, but we do have some other little toys that we play with, and these are kind of cool for it's a little ROV that you can go down and look at cool stuff. This is just a sediment sampler. We grab a bit of the sediment and it's got a camera in it. Um, you have magnetometers, which are useful for looking at the geology. And also if you go over a buried shipwreck, you will actually get a couple of like pings on that. We don't use it as much as we used to, but um, there's a, there's a kind of a plan, I guess, to, to go back and look at areas of interest rather than tow this around all the time, because we lost so many of them, they get snagged on fishing pots and it's an expensive thing to lose. And again, being you know, interested in the seabed, we need to know what, what it's made of. And the best way to do is go down and actually take a chunk out of it and um, these are the kind of instruments that just goes down as it hits the bottom, the jaws close and you bring up whatever, whatever is on top of it. And then to get a bit deeper into the sediment, you can use that yellow tube on the left, which has got a big weight on it. And when you get close to the seabed, you let it go and it drives into the seabed, you recover it and it'll come up with it up to three meters of a, of a core sample of the seabed, which can tell you a lot about what the seabed was like up to millions of years ago. And again, we can use sleds on the seabed, which have cameras on. And then this one here, the Vibracora, as you can see there, it can get down six meters into the seabed. So that central tube is vibrated into the seabed. And when it reaches its depth, then it, it's got a, a cow catcher, they call it, it's just like an inverted um, umbrella at the bottom of the of the tube and when you pull it up again it holds sediment in that tube and you you literally are going back to you know the dawn of time basically and then you can go see the guys do. And there's a lot of other stuff what we have to do in terms of all this is like keep base stations for gps tidal data this is oshin going down a the side of a key wall and drilling in and installing tie gauges. And we do 
we used to have to do those like every month and then move on and then change location. But I'll show you just now we beat that system. Size scan sonar is still very interesting to, to people interested in wrecks. Um, very high resolution sideways looking sonar. And that's on the back of the Kiri and we can put quite sophisticated um, GPS tracking onto it. And this is the Guide Me To wreck, which is just off of um, Dorky. Well, it's just outside the Muglins there. And it's very popular with divers. And uh, that's, that's a side scan image of it, which in the early days was a better picture of the wreck than what we get off a of multi-beam. Um, however, these days you'll see just now that the multi-beam is, is almost a better image unless you're trying to look underneath it. Now, I know there's a few divers in the audience there, and that was just a, if we lose the pinger, we have a, a handheld device that you can dive with, which will locate the, the pinger that's lost on the seabed if you get snagged. And divers can use that just to, it's a range and, range and uh, no, it's just a ranging system that you can, if the range is getting shorter, swim that way. If the range is getting longer, you're going the wrong way. LIDAR is an airborne system for doing the seabed mapping as well. I'm not going to get into too much detail. And excuse me here because I will rush through this just to keep us within a bit of time. But LIDAR can do a much bigger area than, than the boats can. And Clue Bay was a great example of it. We had this done back in 2006 or seven. And it uses lasers, uh, two different lasers. So you have the red laser bounces off the surface and the green laser actually hits the seabed and the difference between the two will give you the depth. You can also use satellites. Uh, satellites use uh, the, the light spectrum. So this is like very dark blue spectrum and you can see certain things. And then as the spectrum moves off to the, um, you know, down the spectrum, if you like, you can see different colors until other details pop out. And ultimately with some clever maths, you come up with a, a depth chart. Now this works fairly well or quite well in the South Pacific and the Caribbean. We have very clear water. It's not so great in Ireland. Um, you can see here in Wexford, this was uh, where, they, where we tried it. And this is, you know, the green, yellow, red just shows you, it was fairly reliable in the yellow, sorry, in the green areas, but the rest of it really wasn't of much use to us. And anyway, that green area was kind of shallow enough that you could, you could look at Google Earth and tell you the same information. Um, so from a cost benefit point of view, it's not the best way to go yet. And there are developments going on. Uh, but it is kind of useful for um, quick looks and finding areas in a channel or something like that where you might have issues, tell the harbor master, he might send out a boat. So in terms of uh, scoping out something is quite useful, but in terms of having a definitive depth, um, we, we, didn't, we didn't carry on down that road. Okay, I'm just gonna leave that. This is all the same is what I've just been talking about. And then we get to positioning. And as I was saying, we really need to worry about the motion and where we are and all that for these systems to work very well. And one of the most important things is, is what do you refer your depth to? So chart datum, we all understand is, you know, the least possible depth, which is normally LAT plus a best guesstimate of the worst case scenario. And that's that's actually derived literally from humans talking to each other and saying, well, we better add on 20 centimeters here. Oh no, it never gets more than 10 centimeters here. Uh, and that's what chart datum is. So LAT is a, is a more mathematical way of doing it. So we base all of our work on LAT. Um, and the old way of doing it, the survey vessel will come in 
measure the depth and the time of the observation. Then you get a tie gauge and between the time and the tie gauge and a co-tidal chart, we can make the best mathematical um, assumption that that's what the depth is. Uh, what we do nowadays, um, sorry, next one. What we do nowadays is we use uh, the vessel coming in with GPS. It measures the height of the vessel above the reference frame of the earth for GPS. And then we use a mathematical model developed by the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office. And they give us a tidal correction based on the WARF model, which is just, WARF stands for the vertical offshore reference frame. And that gives you a direct depth measurement, which is much more, in other words, you don't, it's as, as if you have a tie gauge wherever you go, which makes it more accurate. And I think there's a number here. Uncertainty associated with the WARF model result is 0 0.12, so 12 centimeters. And it, even the tie gauges that you look at, if you look at a board nailed to the side of a tied wall, or even the electronic ones, the jumpiness of the data is huge. So that's, as far as we are concerned, that's the most accurate way to do it, even though it's coming from a model. And that model is derived from gravity, and gravity is very easily measured by satellites. So it's a win-win for us. And this just shows you the the curve of the tide against manual measurements and using the vessels tied up alongside. And so we, we sat there for 48 hours sometimes using our onboard measurement tools and doing the um, manual measurements and using the Wolf model. And there's very little difference except where the GPS jumps up and down now and again. And mathematically, that's very easy to smooth out. So we're very confident in the height of the water or the, the measurement of the depth of the water. And you have to be because of all of these international hydrographic office um, specifications for what we need to measure, our, you know, the accuracy of how we measure it. And as I said, I'm going to send on all the stuff to you guys if you want to have a look at those numbers. Um, but I'm going to run through something here that um, I think a few of you guys might have met my, my friend August Magnusson, the, the Icelandic skipper of the, of the Kerry, and, and he's a great guy. And he's, um, he put together this slideshow, and I'm going to really go quickly if I can, but it, it's quite good in, whoops, I should actually go back there. What he was saying there, you do all your preparation, everything's ready to go, and you head out the harbor, and that's what you see. There's no surveying in that. He then goes on, this, this is the effect of measuring this, the velocity of sound in water. So every single echo sounder measures the time it takes for a, a pulse of sound to go from the echo sounder, bounce off the bottom, back to the echo sounder. But you need to know the speed of sound to calculate the distance. And if you don't know the speed of sound, this is these, every single little dot on that screen is one measure, one echo sound of measurement. But if you don't know the speed of sound, then it just makes a nonsense of it. So this is like down in Cork Harbor, he was showing that he had to break it up into areas, how many speed of sound profiles he had to do. And each one of those squiggly lines shows by depth, the difference in speed of sound every time you take a measurement. So it's really important to understand that that's important. And most ships echo sounders and yacht echo sounders are actually set at 1500 meters a second. The colder the water, the slower the speed is. So you can see there it's going from 1492. Now in shallow water, it doesn't make any difference to you yacht echo sounder because A, the footprint is quite big, so it doesn't matter what you're actually measuring. And, you know, the, the difference between 1492 and 1500 
meters a second in 10 meters of water is negligible. I mean, you, you can you can measure it in a by the by the tot of your whiskey or whatever. So we we worry about that because all the errors add up, and so you don't want all that to happen. Now this is just a cool picture. I don't know if you can recognize it. It looks like a a ghoul with two black eyes and tentacles or something. It's just Cork Harbor, and the eyes are um, uh, the Spike Island and Hall Bolan. But yeah, you know, like these are really important waterways, and if we if we don't eliminate the errors to the best of our ability, then you know, putting standards onto your data is hard for the mariner to rely on the data. And the UK Hydrograph Hydrographic Office really come down hard enough on us if we don't um, report all of the methods that we use in order to get safe navigation data. Again, this is a lot of August explaining why he's so good at what he does. But the ultimate result is that it's all processed up and you shouldn't be able to see the difference between each line of data because you applied the maths to it in such a way that is correct. And then you start seeing the real seabed. When you first go up and down, because each little yellow line there is one pass of the boat. The first time you do it, you, you look at the data and you say, nobody will ever want to use this. And then you can concentrate in on um, you know, areas of interest. But if the data has been driven, like this is on the RV Geo by a new skipper, and he was going all over the place, it looks like a, a bowl of spaghetti, as opposed to an experienced skipper that would keep the line straight. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of online QC that you have to do with the data. And that's really where the experience of people and passing on that experience is really important. And we really try hard to make sure that as we bring in kids a lot of the time, that we make sure that they really know what, what they're doing in order to make the data good. Sorry, this is not clicking on. I'm going to go through this. That is all about. So I'm just going to fly through this. This is August put this through. I was actually on shore taking pictures of the Kerry, but that this is up off uh, Ackle. And you can just see the Kerry going up towards some sort of white water there. And all of a sudden, hard to starboard. So you can see there that he's already picking up a shoal and then going around the outside of it and getting then quite close into the shoal. And it's all fashionably in point there. And those red lines are the track lines of the boat. And that's the, the end result. But the interesting bit is where it goes through the through that gap. And as you get closer and closer to closing off that gap, you're still not sure if you can take your own vessel through there until you get the one beam on this side to meet up with the other beam on the other side. And then you kind of have to take a, a gamble and say, are we going to go for it? And you go for it and you get through the gap. But it is a risky game and you do get close to the rocks. Now, obviously this isn't the same rock, but um, it's just the, it's great crack in a way is, is the bottom line. Yeah. You don't get much shadow than this. Yes, you do. It's... So yeah, I mean, he went on then to, to talk about crewing on the, on the small vessels and we don't have time to get into that. I just want to touch up some of the, the other stuff here quickly is that, you know, there, there's obviously a big cost to all of this. And we had Price, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers do a study on it and a cost benefit analysis. And ultimately they came up with um, the cost benefit ratio of 4.4. And that's, that's on the low end globally of other studies. And there have not been that many of them but it, be, it meant that we were one of the first ones in, in the world to do this. And it's been quoted at, uh, at the EU, at UN level, everywhere, that the way we approach this project um, has led to other people approaching it the same way. 
And the cost benefit ratio has gone from four in our case um, to more than 35 in the US, USA. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, out in Manine Bay, there's a shoal out here. Um, I don't know if you can see the little red square on the on your left hand side there. There's a big rock the size of a cathedral that if a if a tanker went in there to anchor uh, to get out of a storm or anything like that, and this is a, a, a real scale model, it would it would swing into that rock. It's 12 meters deep. So the USA based a lot of their cost benefit analysis on the fact that these sort of things could happen. And if we didn't detect rock like this, then the cost of a environmental um, disaster of a big oil spill would be in the billions. And therefore you can say it was 35. So we actually excluded that out of ours and still came up with four, four and a half times the value of the survey. So just to, I'm just going to go through a couple of quick things here. We're, the other things that we do in the marine and coastal units. So there's, um, we, we're, we're looking at coastal erosion, sea level rise. Um, Seabed 2030 is a plan by the, U, you know, the IHO to map the entire planet the way we've done it. We've also done some education stuff where we, we have an MSc module now at Maynooth um, University. We're rolling that out. It should be in UCD as well. So that's like a, a full module for students. Um, we're also working quite closely with the offshore renewable energy people, which are in the same department that I'm in. And then there's Action 23 of Harnessing Our Ocean Wealth Policy and Action 26 of the Climate Action Plan. We're slightly also involved with marine spatial planning, but that's, a, that's another can of worms, which I won't get into now. This is also some of the coastal monitoring. We have a laser scanner we can put on a Jeep and ride up and down the beach and get really high resolution data that you can use for monitoring the changes on the beach. And this is over in England where we're thinking about getting a system similar to this. But that's, that's not a photograph, that's actually data. Uh, it takes 2 million scans a second and it gives it a real color and so for coastal monitoring and seeing how erosion works, this is something we're trying to get cross government support to buy and, and do some real coastal monitoring as opposed to, um, you know, satellite or you know, aerial photographs and that, but measure down to sub meter changes. Uh, having said, you know, we're not using satellites, we are, of course, and, you know, it, it does the whole country very quickly. And then we also you know, are involved with quite a few interreg projects, which are European funded. And um, the Cherish project, which is online as well, um, uses our data and heritage and archeology span data. And they're looking at you know, specific sites around the, uh, the coast of Ireland and Wales and doing some pretty cool stuff with it in terms of, you know, informing methods really on how to go. So it's kind of, you know, groundbreaking stuff um, using the kind of data that we have that we hadn't thought would be useful, but apparently it is, so that's brilliant. And again, tie gauge stuff, this is out on uh, Inish Moor, and we've got a tie gauge paid for by the, the UN and, that's doing radar measurements or sea level rise. And that's actually a primary um, tsunami warning for the whole of Europe. Uh, it's the one closest to where if there's a fault on the rock or bank, which we've identified has happened before from the data that we've looked at from the INSS, there was actually a big landslide off the side of the, the canyon there, which inundated Europe back well, a long time ago. I'm not sure of the dates, uh, but the idea is that if you have a warning system in Inishmore, it's not going to save Ireland from a catastrophic result, but it will save the people in Portugal and vice versa. They have one down there, which is looking for a tsunami coming from the Canary Islands. And 
these things actually run in real time. So, you know, if we get a message from Portugal to say there's a wave hitting Lisbon, which wiped out Lisbon a long time ago, we would know that we had enough hours to evacuate people off the coast here. So these these are these are things that people don't really think about, but you know, there's fingers in these different pies, I guess. Um, and that's a, it's just a real thing. That's just our internal stuff. I know. This is a, this is one of those things that are real, and and I wanted to put it in there because there's a lot of people involved that um, that work with us and are, are cool and and have done a lot of like innovative stuff. I'm not sure if I have enough time to go through too much of this, but I'm going to fly through it and give us a chance at the end just to um, ask questions if we need to. So the UAU is the um, underwater archaeology unit of the Depart of the yeah, Department of Housing and Planning. And we've worked a lot with them. And I know Paddy Barry was up here with us. Uh, he anchored off and came in to see us. And we were doing a lot of wreck investigations up there. And, and I think we can come back to this later if we want to. But there's a lot of diving off the back of the Kerry, and it's um, it's 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 a really nice part of the job. You know, you're just not mowing the lawn. Uh, that's actually myself being taught how to put a suit on. I was only down for 20 minutes after that, but it was great crack. You also get involved with a lot of interreg projects, which are fun. Some of the the work that we do, and this is specifically up in Dundalk Bay. Uh, and this is us rigging up. Um, yeah, it's, it brings the, the yachty side out and in me anyway, that you can rig up all this stuff and tow different instruments behind you. Now I'll just go through this fairly quickly. But ultimately we, we got the whole of Dundalk Bay mapped uh, through funding from the EU. And just down on the right there, you can see the sub bottom profiler, which shows you what's actually underneath the seabed. So that's a whole um, different ball of wax that we use for looking at the geology as well. I'll we'll come up to that in a minute. The aquaculture people, especially BIM, really interested in mapping areas that they have projects in. So that's the reason why we were up in Inish Boffin there, Daryl. We were doing a job for the, for the BIM. They were looking at uh, aquaculture sites um, near Inish Turk there. And there had been some previous work there. But before I move on there, if you, could, if you guys look at this, like dark and light gray around the islands. Basically, that's, that's a really cool thing about any echo sounder is that it, um, it can also measure the intensity of the sound return. So it's not just measuring the distance to the seabed, but it's also me measuring how strong the reflection of that sound signal is. So where it's dark, it's, it's bounced off a rock really quickly and come back almost the same strength as you send it out. And where it's light gray, it's being absorbed into the seabed. So you can tell whether it's mud or sand or whatever. And that's a, a really um, useful tool because then you can, you, you know, this kind of data, if it's available to fishermen and that, they know, oh, we're catching whelks here. Well, let's see, it's all light gray where we catch whelks. Well, why go to the dark gray if you, you know, so you can, target areas much more specifically. So that's what we call backscatter. Uh, and, and it's a really useful tool. Um, that's just more of that. So this is just different ways of visualizing data. Uh, you can do it all in 3D and move it around. This, this was the specific area that BIM was looking at for uh, like one of those larger fish farm um, projects. To be honest, I, yeah, th those are two areas around the, uh, the Aran Islands that they were interested in doing some, some large projects as well. I just threw this in here, the, the Navy, we work quite closely with them, but normally only in search and rescue efforts but they are looking at putting multi-beam on their ships as well. And Mark Mellich, the, the chief of the Defense Force, 
he's he's hopeful that in you know within years they might get a multi-purpose vessel rather than a patrol vessel which would have scope then to actually put um, large you know vessels larger than the ribs that they use for interception and that but small survey vessels onto the onto the naval ships and that you know with the, with the advent of better systems i think that would be kind of cool if they can do it now left the good stuff into last the wrecks um, they are underwater hazards we have to worry about when we find them you know there, there are issues about whether they graze and that but in general all of our data is published on a on a on a database. I think there's only very few of them that are not, and those are being kept back for one or two reasons, and eventually they will be up there, um, but they're not a danger to uh, navigation or anything like that. But it's, it, they're kind of hard to find. Uh, you can see there that green box, there's a, a small little bump in what looks like flat seabed. That's the kind of stuff you look for. And then you go over it and those little red lines on it show where the vessel has been over it again. And then we do a report a wreck and send it into the UKHO with some images. Um, and we, this goes back a couple of years, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but it's all online on our, on our website. But there's some pretty cool images and these are all fairly old ones. Uh, 2012, that sort of thing. On the right hand side there is the the grid we laid down over that wreck in in uh, Rutland um, that's actually the archaeology grid that went over it but you can see here like the, they're not great images of wrecks you know and that's really because the systems we're using are still maturing at this stage and here it was done in Yall no sorry in Skull um, Somebody, the dread, I mean, a dredger, it's sort of knocked into a wreck <clears throat> in the top of the image there. So we just surveyed the whole area and found another wreck, and it's known as a, the coconut wreck because there's a lot of coconuts found on board it. Um, so usually they're quite easy to see. Um, <clears throat> very often they're not that easy to see. Like in there, there is a wreck, it's hard to see it. So you have to do some analysis of it and you have to really go through the data in different kinds of ways and different ways of looking at it. And eventually it pops up and then it becomes something that you can actually identify. Now just, <clears throat> I don't wanna really draw attention to the Manchester Merchant as such, but just have a look at the way that image looks now and compared to a couple that'll come up later. Now you can see that's uh, probably in uh, 2011, I think we surveyed that the first time with the Celtic Voyager. Lusitania is obviously a wreck everybody's interested in. Um, there's a lot of stories behind it. And that was one of our first surveys of it. So you can actually see all the, the sort of mow the lawn effect going it's just a cross over the over the ship and that's the kind of resolution that you get in 100 meters of water so not brilliant uh, this is the second survey we did it when we had a the newer system on board and you can see it's a lot better there's more definition unfortunately i don't think i have the latest one we have where you can actually see the creases in the plates and that Now, if this was a, a talk about wrecks, I could go into depth about this, but I'm not. But as I said, like the information is there if you guys want want to download this later. But there's several wrecks around. Uh, a lot of the time, there's no wrecks, and that's the problem. You know, you go over a lot of data like this, and you could be looking and looking, but there's actually nothing there. And then you look in one place, and it could be and yeah, the fun starts again. Yeah, we all be we all like hunting wrecks, but it's not um, 
it's not always as easy as this where they're very linear. And again, a lot of these are old ones, but this is where you start looking at the Kowloon Bridge and you can start seeing the detail. They're, those are individual plates that are lying around there. And even there, you can see some of the rock strata underneath it sort of affecting, you know, exactly where there isn't any of the wreck left. It's been pushed around, pulled apart. Um, it's an interesting wreck because, uh, you know, you can, you can measure things like climate change and that off of it because of the way storms have broken up these wrecks. Now that's the Manchester Merchant. And it's a huge difference from the picture I showed you three slides back. Uh, you can actually see the boilers there and the, the plates with the ribs on them lying around the wreck. And all of that data is available for everybody to view. It's all on our website. And once you're on the website, there's actually links to different viewers that you can have a look at. And yeah, that's saying the same thing. This is a book that um, underwater archaeology people, I don't know if a few of you all know Carl Brady. Um, Ian Lawler works for BIM. He has a huge collection of um, photographs of of the ships, you know, old postcards and that uh, before they were sunk. So it was, a, it was a great reference point to, to do the before and afters. And the book's quite good that way. He's got, those are his uh, pictures up on the top and then our data showing it on the seabed. That's one of Ian's pictures of a U-boat up in Belfast and diving pictures. So it's a cool book to, to go through. And that one about the warships and that came out in 2012. And then in 2019, um, the gang put together a book specifically on the Lusitania. So just getting back to our boats and that, the, those are just different pictures of them again. So you recognize them next time you're out there. And this is a little drone picture of the boats tied up down in Baltimore. And we saw that earlier, but it's just to show that the, the lure, the 11 meter rib also goes out to 30 mile limit and the carry also comes in inshore. And those different colored blocks are basically each vessel's survey effort. And I think this is all in 2019. Uh, yeah, 2019. So you can see it's a bit of a quilt work that we have to stitch together. Um, also right on the inshore stuff, there's the the geo and the low working right in shore as well. Um, and that's just the, a very rough showing of the data in 2019 and getting in around Baltimore on the inshore vessels. And once you merge that with what was done originally by the Marine Institute, that's what we mapped around Baltimore. So it's a hard life, but somebody has got to do it. Yeah. And it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, you are literally up and down the coast down there and getting to know the locals and the lifeboat crews and it's brilliant stuff. You know? um, and they all love it. And we try and engage as many local people as we can. And obviously there's the, the, the Marine station down in Shirkin and Matt has been a friend of the project for a long time. And he was really delighted to see us doing this. You know? So it's just showing you some of the detail around there. Uh, scary stuff in amongst the rocks in certain places. And then Lochheim, that's the, the channel into Lochheim. And you can see it there in a kind of a 3D view of it. A lot of this now hasn't, I mean, there's better re resolution images, but this is what we just took off doing the job. Now, this is all the boring stuff, so I'm going to fly through it. But we have to work it all out, you know, how much are we going to do every year? So there's lots of spreadsheets and we use the old charts um, and ACTUS charts, the electronic charts to work out the depths from what we think should be there. We do the calculations, put it all together, put it into a spreadsheet essentially and try and work it out per thousand square kilometers. And then we come up with what we think we can do per year. And there you can see there the target was 3,390 square kilometers and we achieved 3,562. So not a bad model for guessing what you can, can and cannot do. 
never mind the weather and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, we started to know what we're doing. And this is the plan for this year. So that red area, we should have finished the stuff <coughs> south of Baltimore, but we just had one bad month of weather, which we couldn't get out there. But it's not so much the big blocks of red, it's the small little bits in along the coast. That's what eats your lunch, it just takes forever. Just quickly then, um, a few other things that we do. Um, this is what we did, yeah, last year. COVID delayed us a little bit. We were in Castletown Bear, so obviously you work from, you do whatever you can to help the harbour masters out, and then he gives you the keys to the showers. Um, Bear Island, so you can see we got really in tight around the island there. Another real map of Bear Island. Uh, Cod's head, lots of nice geology there. And that's the calf, the bull, and the, the cow. And that's a Spanish trawler that's right in the entrance to Costa Bay. Now, that's the way we see it in real time as you go over it. It's only when you clean it up afterwards that you get more high resolution. And again, the Manchester Merchant showing you the detail that you can get when you, when you look at it, um, when you go over it several times. We also did an MSc with uh, Maynooth University, did 15 hours of teaching, uh, plus two days of time on the Voyager, which we had to do virtually because of the COVID. But it's, it's trying, to get, trying to get the young people involved again. Um, and we, you know, we're gonna keep on rolling that out, but there's a, it, there's a lot of effort in it, but uh, I think hopefully we can do a, a virtual thing that we can give to especially the, I think the, the people in the Maritime University down in Cork, you know, the Maritime College, uh, Cormac de Bru there is very interested in getting his instructors to, to do the course so that he can feed it into the Mariners courses, you know, the, the deck officers, et cetera. So they understand where it all comes from. Then offshore renewable energy, all the windmills, obviously there's a lot of interest now in our data. Uh, there's the EMODnet, which is the European data warehouse for all of this data, and it's broken up in all, all sorts of themes. Um, geology is obviously one that we're in, and bathymetry, I think we are the biggest contributor in Europe to the EMODnet, although I might be wrong because France um, has a similar sort of size of data, but they also claim their foreign um, yeah, you know, the overseas territories and all that sort of thing. But we're definitely at the top of the pile in that. Um, so in the geology of EMODnet, I'm gonna fly through this very quickly, but just to see what we actually do with the data besides put it on charts and look at pretty pictures of wrecks and stuff. <clears throat> you, know, you look at the real geology and you can convert the grids and look deeper into the data and put all the sub bottom stuff and interpretation and that <clears throat> into systems which take this pretty picture of uh, you know that's the mouth of Waterford and the river there uh, but there's all these little channels off to the side and what are they what form those channels are they either going to be geological faulting or they're going to be old landscapes of rivers or you know, understanding that stuff is important to understanding the planet. And so we look at it. I'm just sorry, I'm just going to click through quite quickly. Look at the sub bottom data where you can see things buried. And then digitize it onto where you can have some sort of confidence of what you're looking at. And this feeds into a, a bigger understanding of the whole of what Ireland looked like, looked like before the Ice Age, and that blue line around Ireland is where the old coastline used to be. And then understanding the way that's been eroded, or you have, um, you know, the, where the ice has actually pulled back from Ireland, it took the weight off so she can actually bounce up again or tilt it one way or another. And there's all these different isoclastic movements um, where the, the weight of the ice actually changed the level of Ireland, you know, so she's actually 
she hasn't really bounced up, but she's just tilted a bit. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff, but you have to be a bit academic for it, I guess. But I, I don't. I left this in here because I thought I might have gone through my slides too slowly, but I was definitely on the wrong track there. So it's all there in, in the presentation for you to look at. And I mentioned the coastal monitoring we do and the tsunamis in the real map of Baltimore. Just another pretty picture of the Manchester Merchant. But then just from the, for the day-to-day -day stuff as well, you know, the Navy will send over a patrol, I mean, a, a rib. This, this was actually when Leo Varaka was on board and uh, they came over to pretend that Ronan there sitting down was a terrorist trying to kill Leo and they arrested him and took him over and then they brought him back and gave him a beer. We do some work with the helicopters, you know, obviously they're, they're fairly stable platforms and they, they kind of like working with us in a way because very often they just work on ferries and that, whereas, whereas these sort of jobs are a little bit more challenging. And again, that's where they, they come over with the, the boats as well as the helicopters. And even down in Baltimore, they used to come over and see if they could tow us in and put us aside nicely. And yeah, so it's, it's good fun to work with them and they enjoy it, we enjoy it. There's always a good couple of pints up in, in the pub afterwards. And because we all, you know, in the geological survey, we get close to the rocks and I think that's off the old head of Kinsale. Um, but yeah, as I say, we, we try to map all the water, both inshore and offshore. And that's a gang. And I think it's worth noting really that um, it, it, they're mostly young people. Yeah, and very often this game is, 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 is quite well popular, populated with older people, especially like over in the UK and that. But um, yeah, we, we have a good ethos of trying to bring on people and train them up and hopefully get them jobs in industry as well. So that's it from me, lads. I don't know if we have time for questions. But I'm more than happy to stay on and, and um, answer anything that you guys want to. And we can go back on the slides if you need to. Uh, could I just say thank you, Sean, for a very informative and very enjoyable uh, talk. And uh, I certainly know a lot more than I did before I started about our coast and all it entails. Uh, one question I have for you is, how soon after you've discovered uh, depths that are not in accordance with the, with the charts or like that tanker in the rock, how soon does it... Uh, how long does it take for that to be translated onto a, an actual chart from the uh, the chart office in England? Yeah, no, that's a good one, Johnny. The essentially the the liability um, rests with us until we pass it on. So if there's a danger danger to navigation, we have to inform the the mariner as soon as possible, and that's done through an H note, the hydrographic note we send to the hydrographic office. That as soon as we send that H note, our responsibility is lifted. Then the responsibility is with the charting agency. So then it becomes a UKHO responsibility. And literally that can happen within, within the day or hours after discovering it, if it's a serious issue. At the latest, probably a week before we inform them knowing that you know, there's no tankers going in here, so a 12 meter rock isn't really gonna hurt them, but you are taking a chance for a couple of days. Once it goes to the UKHO, they put it out on notice to mariners immediately. So in theory, you as a mariner is listening to the radio when they do all those navigation warnings and you jot it down and put it on your chart. Now, we, know, we all know that that's not always the case, but um, if there is a serious danger, the, the likes of the Irish Lights or the Navy or even ourselves would try and either mark it or do something you know, to mitigate any risk. Yeah? 
but in, in terms of actual responsibility, the mariner should have the most up-to-date navigation information. And therefore, if it's gone out on notice to mariners, you are responsible as the mariner if you hit the rock. Thank you. Does that answer? Yeah. But it is as soon as we can, is, is the bottom line. Yeah. John, does the, does the UK Hydrographic Office ever ask you specifically to survey particular areas? No, they have no jurisdiction over that. And we actually only have a, we have a formal agreement, but it's, it's more of a gentleman's agreement yeah. uh, between them and us in that they, they are a, a, a global charting agency. So we, we give NOAA, which is the North American data holders, yeah. the UKHO, and I think there's uh, the Canadian Hydrographic Office as well. Okay. We actually send our data to them, primarily to the UKHO, because they're the only ones that actually produce up, updated charts for home waters, as it's called. Yeah. And um, so now we have a really good working relationship with them and they've been very good and they actually make a loss on Irish charts for the sales, you know, the, but they're not coming in and having to spend the money to survey it. So it's, mm. it's, a, it's a, what do you call it? A beneficial win-win arrangement. Yeah. Okay, thank you. John, I might ask a question. I know it's only a drop in the ocean uh, by comparison to all the work that you've done, but I'm just wondering, has the, the south side of Dublin Bay been comprehensively surveyed? The south side? Yeah. Yeah, I, to be honest, we first surveyed it almost between the, the Pool Bag Light and the, the west the end of the west pier yeah, and since was, then I, since then we've been pushing it in and we yeah. we're actually at plus one from lat now pushing yeah, it in so the, the reason i'm asking you is because of a specific interest in that relative to a talk that i gave on zoom uh recently about the wreck of the palm uh back in the 1990s early 90s myself and a colleague actually discovered the site of it, the, the ship that was wrecked in 1895, the lifeboat number lost. Uh, and we got a huge sub-bottom reading on it and a subsequent dive that we did in very bad visibility. There was just a few small bits of it sticking up, but that's all we could see. I'm just wondering if would there be a, an infrared image of that particular area available? Yeah. You know, you know, Cormac, when I was showing you earlier there that the, um, how, how hard it is to see a wreck is <laughs> it's, it's, it's a simple explanation is that you could never sit down and go through every single patch of data with with a micro with a microscope on it Absolutely. so we we try all the tricks we can and if you can make it show up then you investigate it further but if, if you don't see it on the first pass, you don't see it. Right, yeah. And if you're not looking for it, you won't see it. And so therefore, I mean, if you know roughly where it is, my best suggestion is get hold of Sharice, which I don't know, you know you've know, you met her before. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she will go and look through the data again. Because if you look on our viewers and all that, we, I mean, it's, it's actually physically impossible <laughs> to put the resolution up on the web because, you know, I mean, it's just too, it's, it's not fast enough yet. Yeah, It'll be 10 years up. before you can look at our raw data on, on the internet. Well, I'll look and see what's available anyway. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, but if, if you know data, where you want to look and speak to her, she can pull up the data Yeah. and, and give you something to look at that's much higher yeah. resolution. And I'll get in touch with it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was only talking to her about that today because I think people will ask for that stuff. And as the, the local lifeboat manager in Dunleary, I'd be really interested in knowing exactly the coordinates of that of that wreck. Yeah. Of course, yeah. 
No, it, seriously, Cormac, if you if you have a good idea about it, I mean, like there's there's two issues there. I mean, there's there's confidentiality. If somebody wants to look for something where, um, you know, I mean, all our data is publicly free available, but you know, if if you wanted it sort of like on a on a research premise or something like that. Yeah. Now, in, in that particular wreck, we actually got the coordinates for it half a decade at the time. We didn't have GPS. So I do, I, I do actually have the the, uh, the longitude and latitude of it. So we'll be able yeah. to narrow it down a bit. Yeah, there, there, there are utilities that you can convert the old DECA lines into, uh -huh. DECA readings into. Yeah. Um, I think we did that actually like, in, in long and lots, you know? Yeah, one, one of the, the older members of the of the um, DMYC, he had a lot of marks in, in around the Irish Sea that were all in in Decca. Yeah. And then he actually gave me his old graph papers and I found that's why I found the, the converter. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hi Sean, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sean, uh, I presume all your servers are done to a single chat data. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, essentially we try and keep it all to uh, 84. Well, it's WG said 84 in the in the horizontal, but the, the vertical datum is LAT, so lowest astronomical tide, okay. which okay. is not chart datum. All right. What, while you're surveying, do you take temperature readings as well? When I was when I did a not a very good job of going through the sound velocity to prove, you know, the speed of sound in water. In order to determine that, you need the temperature. Okay. And you need the conductivity and you need salinity. Yeah, I'm interested in how you're seeing uh, climate change and how, how do you see what's happening at the moment? It's a good question, Sean, and we don't look at it from that point of view yet. We okay. have all the data there, but, you know, be, because we're not systematically testing one place over and over again. We have millions of records, but you can't correlate it to one place and going back to that same place every year in order to get the seasonal side of it and all that. So it's not that easy to do it that way. Now, in theory, um, some sort of a machine, machine learning type code could take all of all the boats, the marine and sea boats, our boats, private survey. If we put all of that data into a, a big bucket and got the right spoon, stirred it up, you should get some answers. But nobody's actually working on that at the moment, as far as I know. It's all taken off the data boys, which is probably as good, good enough, but you can have local effects there. So rigor, rigorous science sometimes isn't as rigorous as you think it is. It's got to be <coughs> paid for and all of that. And yeah, so. Well, congratulations. I think GSI did a superb job. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, I must so, say it's a, great, yeah. it's a great job, but uh, sorry. Sean, sure. sure. uh, do you have time for one more question? Absolutely, yeah. Hi, so Ed here and Kerry is very pleased to have seen you in Bantry Bay last year. We were small rib, but I was also delighted that it didn't mean there were any more fish farms or turbines going in there, but it was part of this great project. Um, can, can you speak to the, the, the value of otherwise these crowd, crowdsourced sonar things, um, the stuff that you find in Navionics, which uh, causes me some concern at times? Yes, crowdsourcing is a, is a, is a yeah, it's an interesting one, and it depends. It depends on the quality control is, is the bottom line. So the IHO is, is in favor of it. Our, our hydrographer who is in the Marine Safety Office put a, put a paper around um, asking all the stakeholders in Ireland that the Navy was not very happy with the idea of doing it. Um, we we are not put off by it and there are different algorithms that you can use to make sure that the depth is reasonable and it 
to give to give you a real answer is that it's it's as good as a person that gives it to you, obviously, but there are ways that you can statistically mm. make it um, valuable. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not being used at the moment by Navionics. You showed the entrance to the River Island of Baltimore. And if you look at the current Navionics app and go to their, their crowdsourced one, it shows something completely different. It's quite wrong. It shows that you can't, basically you can't use the northern entrance at all. It's, <coughs> it's utterly bogus. And it could cause someone you know, an embarrassment, at least. Yeah. No, and that's it. And that's why Navionics and that all put not for navigation on their charts. Yeah. Um, a lot of our data actually feeds into Navionics. So if, if you're going to argue about crowdsourcing, they are using us as a crowdsourcing contributor. And if you actually look deeper into their data, the data that's coming from us is actually being attributed to NOAA even though we give all that data for free gratis to NOAA. And if you go into the Garmin app for 360 euro, you can download their chart of Ireland and it doesn't even mention Infima. So yeah, th this is, this, it, it was something we discussed right at the beginning of, of Infima, but our sec gen at the time was correct, I think, in saying we should give the data to everybody for free government program and all that but it depends on how you argue what is crowdsourcing then but if if you have some bad data through crowdsourcing then the, the theory is that if you get enough crowdsourcing the the bad guys will be eliminated by the, the good guys if you know what i mean yeah, well, we were very surprised that there wasn't a simple algorithm going on to show if this is massively out with uh, the existing survey, then, 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 then don't use it until you interrogate it, because that particular example is just, is just sort of bonkers. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'll tell you what, if you, if you want to, like, you know, send me a kind of a, a more focused sort of, you know, detail on that it, there's a couple of people that work with me now that will be really interested in that and they can say okay let's go and have a look and you know like norman Keynes and that he, he comes up to us all the time with anomalies and all sorts of things and yeah and norman has to put up with my ranting about navionics in particular it's a pet peeve of mine just how just how inaccurate it is it's yeah. just appalling you know yeah but anyway uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bore you as well with some stuff. <laughs> but, no, I do. I mean, thank you very much. That was... more, I'm more than happy to pass it on to somebody. <laughs> I, I, can I also say how moved I was at your preservation of Captain Bly's little bit? That was absolutely great. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, we have to. We have to look after them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, any more for any more? More than happy. Hi, Sean. Uh, we've been hearing reports about the new vessel of Tom Crean. Uh, is there a delivery date for that vessel? The as far as I know, it's uh, the end of 23. And we're kind of banking on that because it, it, we're not putting as much effort in with the Celtic Explorer because of the costs. And the Tom Crean will be able to do what, what the Explorer is doing for us now. So. Uh, we we are hopeful that it's the end of 23, and I haven't heard any difference. But well, she's a much bigger vessel, I take it, is she? She's in between the Voyager and the and the Explorer, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then they put a lot of thought into it, and like the propulsion system and all. Yeah, she'll be. I think she's got DP. Yeah, she'll be a, a, a game changer for for you know the. The deep water stuff, especially. Yeah, yeah it sounds fascinating. Yeah, I and mean, the Voyager is still a great vessel, and it, you know, wishful thinking they could keep all three of them, but yeah, there, there are costs involved, and it's not it's not cheap at the end of the day. Uh, Sean, can I ask, um, how are you budget wise? You know, are are you satisfied with the budget? That you're being given, or 
Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, inflation hasn't hit us yet. So I think we, we've been okay. Um, yeah, our budget is like, it's 4 million a year. But that's to keep, you know, all the marine institutes <laughs> and, and ourselves going. And there's probably in and around 16 staff plus contractors in for the seasonal stuff. So yeah, no, we do okay. And we have to get, you know, contribute to the equipment on the, the, the vessels and, and our own equipment and all that. But a lot of that comes out of, you know, opportuni opportunistic funding as well. So where some of the climate action funding or something like that hasn't, you know, been allocated. I'm the first one with my hand up. Oh, we need this, we need that. Yeah, so there are, there are alternatives and the European funding comes in and that's so it's, Constantly, I mean, if we just relied on the four million, we wouldn't do it. Sure. Um, but there are other ways of like leveraging what we do and getting involved in European projects brings money in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it doesn't mean you have to work harder and you, you never get a break. Then you're just constantly at it. Yeah. You know? But yes, I mean, we are, we are on budget, on time, on. All of those KPIs are being met the whole way through it. Okay, thank you. Sean, um, you mentioned that the bigger offshore boats can work in the dark, um, but and you also mentioned there about the season and having staff in for the season. What is your season, or, or what, what I mean, do, do the bigger boats work 12 months of the year? What about the smaller boats? <clears throat> yeah, so. The bigger boats, okay, they, they normally tie up around Christmas for a couple of weeks, and that's about it. And they work most of the rest of the time. But a lot of their a lot of the bigger boats work is either for foreign countries. So the Germans have been hiring the Celtic Explorer every year for months and months every year. And then they have a lot of fisheries um, surveys to do for I don't know, the fisheries tallies and all that sort of thing. So that's the big ship we get for about 10 days a year is all we can get. Um, the Voyager does the bulk of what we need and we get her for about 30 days a year. The rest of it is done on research cruises, other, you know, other funding opportunities for them and that. Although we have, you know, Informar pays for the Marine Institute for vessel time. Um, so yeah, I mean, if they weren't operating 24 hours a day, it wouldn't be worth it. But obviously, you know, they're, they're bigger ships so they can do it. The reason this, the inshore boats don't work 24 hours a day is because, mostly because of fishing pots now. Uh, yeah, the fishing pots, I mean, we all sailed around Ireland. They're all over the place and, um, you know, high speed boats and that hitting a fishing pot yeah. at nine o'clock at night when you're really tired will raise the hackles of the MSO before you know it. I don't know if that answers your question. Is, is it yeah, more? it does. Thank you. And also, it's just a manning thing as well. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the bigger boats can go out in, in heavier weather. And obviously, the Explorer can stay out in gales. Now. The Voyager has to come in after, yeah, you know, when you get to Force 9 or whatever. But um, yeah, our boats can't work. The data is useless after about Force 6. So with your weather windows, having uh, 24 hours worth of crew on weather downtime is twice as expensive as you know, a daytime crew only. So yeah, they're, they're, the numbers kind of do work that way. I originally thought that we could run 18 hour days. So sort of two eight or 16 hour days, so two eight hour watches with a crew change in the middle of the day using a rib or something but that just, it just didn't make sense when we tried it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no real cookbook for any of this. So we, we've kind of made it up as we go along with some you know, influence from people from the industry and all that sort of thing. But it, yeah, there's been a lot of lessons learned and most of the time we've written it down and hopefully we can pass on that knowledge to <coughs> especially emerging nations like in Africa and Kenya, very interested in getting hold of our um, 
written up experiences, if you like. I'd just like to say thank you to Sean for his uh, his contribution tonight. Uh, it's obvious he's very passionate about his subject, and um, good luck to him. Well done, uh, fair play, everybody. And uh, listen, I mean, it, it was one of those things where I kind of strung a lot of different things together. But uh, I mean, feel free if anybody ever sees the boats, and that's the best way to find out more is just go down and you know, August and, and the gang that's on the boats are really cool and more than happy to show you around and even take you out of the, if the opportunity is there. Yeah, they're all passenger boats at the end of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Okay, well, look, uh, once again, Sean, thank you very, for a very entertaining evening. And uh, by the looks of things, there's a second uh, talk and that maybe next year. Uh, th thank you to all our guests and to our members. Uh, thank you to Mark and, and to Daryl for organizing the, the talks and the mechanics of it all. And I think without further ado, I'll wish you all a good evening. Mm.